Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We start the new syllabus, which is the 2023 syllabus uh, for 5090 biology. And we start with the chapter one, which is I'm going to solve it. Uh, I'm going to sort of explain it to you in a very slow and a different, different manner uh, than the previous time. Now, the first thing which you download is the syllabus. The syllabus is the most important component which you must have either a hard copy of it or something in whatever uh, devices you use if you have an iPad or a phone or something. But it's better to have a hard copy of it and keep it in front of you whenever you're studying biology. Now I'm going to handle in this video 1.1 only which is the cell structure and function. So we're going to be talking about all these matters. And in the second video then we will handle this 1.2. The first point of the syllabus is examine under the microscope uh, an animal cell and a plant cell. Now for the suggestions which I have made is animal cell is liver cells and cheek cells and plant cells is onion epidermis. The Another thing which you have got to understand is when I asked you to look under the microscope you should be doing this practical work actually in the lab. What do we have in a microscope? Now this is a light microscope. We have an eyepiece lens, you have an objective lens, you must know these names. You have stage clips by which you hold the slide, then you have a diaphragm and a mirror. So of course at times we have a, a one which has an electric connection, then you have a bulb here, you don't have a, a mirror here. Then you have the fine and the coarse focusing knob. Now you must go and look up how to use a microscope because everybody must know how to, you can look up on YouTube and uh, go on any videos and see how to use a microscope. How do you use a microscope? You adjust the mirror or you adjust the light or you switch on the light and add the slide to the stage. So this is the stage of the microscope and you add the slide on it. Then you switch to the lowest magnification and you focus. Then you increase the magnification and you focus and you repeat for the highest magnification. So the different possibilities are X4 which is four times magnified then X10 and then X40. These are the ones that you have to know about in O levels and A levels. So X4 means 4 times, X10 means uh, 10 times and 40 means 40. That is what you use in the light microscope and then you draw the diagram with a sharp pencil and you draw to scale. Now how do you start off? You are making a slide, an onion is cut into quarters, one of the fleshy scale leaves is removed, then you snapping the leaf backwards exposes the epidermis. Then you have a thin layer of epidermis is peeled off. It's just like you have to slowly either with your, if you've got long nails, well, you can do it or you can do it with a, a tweezer or a forceps. Then the epidermis is placed on a slide and covered with two to three drops of distal water. Cover slip is lowered. Number six, a drop of stain is put at one end of the slide. You can use methylene blue or you can use iodine solution. Then a stain is drawn over specimen using a small piece of filter paper. And then you... Uh, add a cover slip on it. Of course, you've added the what drop of stain is added, and then you draw a specimen and you then you add a cover slip on it. So, this is the cover slip that you have placed on top of it, and then you place it on the stage of the microscope and you examine the slide. As this is the first video on uh, this uh, first chapter, I want you to develop some uh, some very important concepts of biology. Number one. If you look at this DNA, DNA is the smallest, it's 10 nanometers. Now let's get the units right. 1 centimeter is equal to 10 millimeter. Right? 1 millimeter is equal to 1000 micrometer. And 1 micrometer is equal to 1000 nanometer. So nanometer is the smallest unit. So this is 10 nanometers. Even if you don't know the units, now when you multiply 10 by 10, that's 100 nanometers. And what is that? That's a virus. So the coronavirus is say 100 nanometers. And then if you multiply this 100 by 10, it's 1000 nanometers. That's a bacteria. So a virus is so tiny that you have to make it 10 times larger to make it a bacteria. And then the human cell is 100,000 nanometers. Oh my God. So a thousand into another hundred and a human cell is hundred times bigger. So a bacteria is ten times bigger than a virus and a human cell is hundred times bigger than a bacteria and a thousand times bigger than a virus. So I want you to understand these sizes 
this is not that something that I'm teaching you A-levels, but I want you to know this concept because this is how you get these concepts wrong at later on in different chapters. So I want these concepts to be very clear to you. I want you to pause the video here and have a look at it. So now looking at this classroom, I mean, the smallest thing that I can think of is this. This eraser here, which is maybe, so this is the smallest thing. And then you have this book, which is bigger than this. And then you have this board, which is bigger than that. So the smallest thing would be a virus. This would be a bacteria. And this would be a human cell. Now, the next syllabus point is that you have to draw diagrams of these cells, which you are seeing in the microscope. So this can come in your paper six or it can come in any other paper as well. Now, for instance, this is a microscope slide of the onion epitome. Now, this is called a photomicrograph. Photomicrograph means what you're looking at, you can just take a picture of it from with a special camera or with your phone, with your camera in your phone. So uh, we, if I ask you to draw, say, draw four adjacent cells. Now, if I say draw four adjacent cells, now which four are you going to take off? Now, if I was uh, you, I would have said, okay, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Now, if I have to draw these four adjacent cells, how would I draw them? Now, you can see I would have drawn this is cell one, this is cell two, this is cell three, and this is cell four. Now, this is how I would have drawn it. And basically, important thing is that you have to draw it what you see. You don't have to draw what you imagine. And then this would have a double line very close to each other. So I would draw a double line. Why am I drawing a double line? Because this is the cell wall. This is a plant cell, onion epidermis. So I would draw this double line all around it. Wherever I am seeing this double line, so I would draw the double line and I would draw exactly what I see. And I'm not going to just make something which I think I imagine I'm seeing, but I am actually draw what I see. So this is what we have to understand is that you would have to draw a double line to show all the cell walls. And when there are two cells, you'll have to draw three lines. So this is where you have to draw a double line here in the center where you're seeing the edges meet, then you'd have to draw three lines. So this is what you would have drawn for this four cells, which you can, which I have, of course, it said draw four adjacent cells. Now, this is a photomicrograph of liver cells. And when you look at liver cells, you'd have to take some piece of liver, chicken liver, and then you'd have to crush them because you'd make a thin film of it. So you would make a thin uh, layer of it and then place it on the uh, microscope slide and then add a dye, either methylene blue or iodine, and then place a cover slip on it and examine it. Now here you see, you see this is a micro photomicrograph. Now, if I asked you to draw four cells, then you would draw these four cells, any four cells. I'm not saying these, you can draw any of these, but here you would not draw a double line. Why? Because there's no cell wall. And you would actually just think like you're tracing it and you would draw it. So if I said four cells, this is what you would have to draw. Now, the another thing which I didn't mention in the last one is the size of the nucleus. The size of the nucleus must be proportional to what you can see not what you can imagine. I usually see uh, teachers teaching you and they'll draw a cell and then they draw the nucleus and that, that shows that the nucleus is that big. It's maybe taking more than half of the entire cell. No, but you will see how much, what is the size of the nucleus as you see in the photomicrograph and you will draw accordingly. So you will not draw a large nucleus, which you think you're imagining it, but you will draw what you can actually see. So this would be what you see. And this is of course a very important part of the syllabus to draw the from a photomicrograph. Now, the next thing which I want you to understand is uh, what is a light microscope and what is an electron microscope? Well, electron microscope would take a room to house it in. It's a huge thing. And a light microscope is small, which you see in your labs every day and you use them in your labs. We use them in the A levels a lot. And what are the basic structures of a microscope? It'll attach to a light source and you know, uh, you'd have these clips, diaphragm, light source, um, you must know these, these are the objective lenses. So if this is X10, and then you have the eyepiece, the ocular lens. Now this also magnifies it, say X10 times as well. 
So now the total magnification will be 10 into 10 and this will be 100 times magnified. So 10 would be the ocular and 10 would be this objective. So 10 times 10 would be 100 times would be the magnification. Electron microscope of course magnifies it to a much much greater level and of course you see now the other mistake that you see you see electron microscopes produce an image which is clear. I'm sorry the word clear is wrong. You cannot use this word. This is incorrect biological English. You don't use this. You say you can see more detail. Just like you have in your uh, cameras in your phone and you have better resolution so that means you can see more detail. So more the detail means it's not magnification. Magnification is okay. You can magnify even in a, in a light microscope. But that is not going to, it is just going to become more blurred. Just like you zoom a picture, it doesn't, you can't see more detail of it. It doesn't become clear. It becomes, in fact, it gets blurred. So if you can see more detail, that means that you can see more details of how that cell works. And you can only see that in electron microscopes. Now, the picture taken on an electron microscope is always black and white and it's called an electron micrograph. While the one taken with a light microscope is called a photomicrograph. So you have to know these differences between photomicrograph and electron micrograph. Now, this is a very good comparison between the light microscope and the electron microscope. When you see some image on the light microscope, it will be called a photomicrograph. This will be called an electron micrograph. Now look at the magnification. This is 2000 times. Well, actually the most useful is only 1500 times. Useful means you can magnify it, but it's not any use anymore because it gets blurred, but you can magnify it. Electron microscope, as you can see, it's very, very, uh, very, very, magnification is so large, 15,000, 20,000, 100,000. Resolution is 200 nanometer. That means you can see two dots which are 200 nanometers apart. You can see them clearly. In this, you can see dots even very close to each other, 0.5 nanometer close, and you can see it very detailed. So we say, when we say better resolution, it means you can see more detail. Don't say you can see the image is clear. Clear is not to be used the word. Image produced visible light rays, electron beam, image focused by glass lenses, by electromagnetic objective lens. Then you have an image viewed through glass ocular lens here on a fluorescent screen, specimen placed on a glass slide, here placed on a copper mesh. Organisms may be live. Here they always have to be dead because the water has to be removed, so that has to be dead material. Specimen requires special treatment, maybe, maybe not. Here, yes, it has to require because you see you have to beam off the electrons of it. Then the color image, yes. Here, no, it's always black and white in an electron micrograph. Now you can see this is a photomicrograph of an animal cell, uh, then another photomicrograph of blood cells, and you can see there's a lot of space in them because that's the plasma which you can see. Then another photomicrograph of uh, cells having a nucleus, uh, frog blood cells are like that. Then another of a plant cell. This is a photomicrograph of a plant cell. This would be all from the light microscope. Another photomicrograph of again animal cells. And then now this is an electron micrograph. Why is it an electron micrograph? Because it's black and white. And you can see the labelings here. And you can see the glabelings here, plasma membrane, which is a cell membrane, mitochondria, and you can see the uh, lysosomes, of course, not in our syllabus, and a very large organelle, which is the nucleus. Uh, another animal cell uh, electron micrograph, you can see this part is the nucleus, which is this whole big thing, which occupies uh, quite a big part of it and it's got all this, you know, mottled appearance, which is actually the chromatin, but I mean, in all levels, you don't have to know it. And then you can see here the mitochondria. The mitochondria here, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So as it is uh, black and white, so you know it's an electron micrograph. Another diagram showing you the tree comparison. Now the things that you've got to understand is you've got to label mitochondria. You got to remember the cell membrane, which is called the plasma membrane here, free ribosomes, the nucleus, uh, the nuclear membrane. Uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum has also ribosomes attached to it, which are called fixed ribosomes and the cytoplasm. And this is all what you have to know. And then you can see the comparison here on this side of the diagram. Please pause the video here and have a look. Now, 
this is a beautiful diagram of an uh, animal cell but of course what i want you to realize is it's not actually like this is a beautiful diagrammatic uh, view of it but about it it helps you to understand the whole concept if you look at it carefully then look at the nucleus now the nucleus is this whole big thing which they have cut across and you can see how these beautiful these pores are and the pores can be seen here all around it where these they allow something to go in and out of the nucleus so it is in contact with uh, the substance in the cytoplasm then you can see this rough endoplasmic reticulum which has the ribosomes on it why is it called rough because it's got these little dots on it and you can see these dots on it these are the ribosomes and then of course there are free ribosomes as well in the cytoplasm so you have to know ribosomes and the ribosome is the important one is in your syllabus then we have got to know the nuclear envelope or it's also called the nucleus then the nucleolus which is inside we just have to know about it not much then you have to know this is called the cytoplasm is more the cytosol or the cytoplasm which you've got to understand then the cell membrane which is also called the plasma membrane is called the cell membrane so the cell membrane encloses this cell and it's the outer boundary of it then look at these beautiful mitochondria i just love them the way they have been depicted they are just absolutely beautiful so the mitochondria here which are the powerhouse of the cell and you can see how they are found and they are small but they are sort of not very correctly in size and so this is the mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell now in the syllabus it says identify identify cell membrane in animal and plant cell cytoplasm in animal and plant cell ribosome in animal and plant cell nucleus in animal and plant cell and chloroplast sap vacuole and cellulose cell wall so if it says identify so you go they will give you diagrams they've set diagrams photo micrographs and electron micrographs so if you can identify them in any of those diagrams well then you really actually you know your biology very well then a quick diagram to show you how you will have to label these there's the nuclear cell wall cell membrane and vacuole now you can see this is a diagram this does not show you any this is not a micrograph it's just an artist view of it and you can see all the different uh, parts of it the nuclear membrane the nuclear envelope the rough endoplasmic reticulum which has the ribosomes on it and these are called fixed ribosomes and then of course you have the free ribosomes as well now here you can see the vacuole which is called the tonoplast and the membrane of it is called the tonoplast inside you have the sap then you can see the chloroplast which you have to identify and you can see these are the chloroplasts which you have to identify in many things and then of course you have the plasma membrane which is the cell membrane and the cell wall which is about 500 times thicker so you can see this is the cell wall and then you can see this is the cell membrane which they have got in yellow here so you have to identify then you can see the mitochondria here very interesting the mitochondria you can see the mitochondria is smaller than a chloroplast so this is the chloroplast the chloroplast is the bigger this one here is the chloroplast and this one here is the mitochondria so you know mitochondria is smaller then you have the labeling uh, cytoplasm and these are the main ones which you must look at and remember these then two electron micrographs why do you know the electron micrographs because they are black and white and this of course is the nucleus which you can see is huge inside an animal cell and this is the nucleus which you have to very clearly identify inside a plant cell then these large thingies that you see these are the chloroplasts and then of course you have the smaller one which are the mitochondria here you can see these so, and this is the large is the cell sap or the vacuole which you can see is pushed to one side because actually you have to make a section of it and it's dead material so sometimes it's slightly deformed but you must be able to pick all these up now another micrograph which you can see here and you can see how the chloroplast now how would you go to identify it now if you are if you were going through all this you can see this is where the nucleus is this is all this mottled look which it gives you the dotted volka dot look is this uh, is the, the nucleus so you can see here the nucleus then the other which i want you to understand is the plasma membrane or the cell membrane which is inside the cell wall and you can see the cell wall is this area which has been shown to you here this place which so this is the cell wall which i am now shading in orange and this is the cell wall and inside this would be a very thin layer which you can't actually see separately 
but I'm just showing you as a line, but it's a very thick line, but it's much thinner than that. Then the chloroplasts are the ones which you can see, I told you, they are smaller than the nucleus. They are smaller than the nucleus. The chloroplast is smaller than the nucleus, but then look at the mitochondria. The mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell, this is the mitochondria here. Now the, so the smallest would be the mitochondria, then the chloroplast, and then the nucleus. And of course, even very small would be the ribosomes, which are just dots, which will be seen here. Then here you can see, as you can see very clearly, this is the vacuole. This inside is the vacuole, which is pushing it everything to the periphery. So vacuole, which is contains the cell sap. Now, these are all the ones that you have to identify, but then you also have to know the functions of each of these. So we have to know the functions. So not only just the identification, but we've also got to know the functions of each of these. So we've got to go through that. Now, the next syllabus point that you must know is what is the structure of a bacteria? First of all, it's much smaller than a plant and animal cell. So, I mean, this may be look a big diagram, but it's actually very, very tiny. And now let's look at the things which are common. Cell membrane is common to plant and animal cells. Then it has a cell wall, but this cell wall is not made up of cellulose. It is made up of something which is peptide, a protein, and peptidoglycan. So it is made up of peptide and a carbohydrate. So it's made up of protein and a carbohydrate. Then it may or may not have a gelatin capsule around it. That doesn't matter. But basically it's got this whole big chromosome, which is a loop of DNA inside it. It's not two-sided, it doesn't it? It is not like a chromosome which has got two ends. One end here and one end here. No, it's a loop, it's like a rubber band. And then it has ribosomes in it, which are common to plant and animal cells. But ribosomes are what? Ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis where proteins are made, where enzymes are made. All proteins are made, not just enzymes, but all proteins, antibodies, hemoglobin, myoglobin, all these are examples of protein which we study, will be studying in humans. And then it's got the jelly-like substance in it, which is called the cytoplasm. So it is this chromosome is made up of DNA. So your syllabus says you've got to know what is the structure of a bacteria. Now, if you look at the features of a bacteria, it's very small, 1,000 times smaller than a plant cell. And it's unicellular, it has a cell wall, which is not made of cellulose or chitin, which is found in fungus, cell membrane, cytoplasm, and has glycogen granules, like in our liver cells, we have glycogen. It has no nucleus. There is no nuclear membrane, only DNA in the form of a single coiled chromosome. Some have a slime capsule and some have one or more flagella in them. Now another diagram showing you some also have DNA in the form of small circles, which is called plasmid DNA. So this is the main chromosomal DNA. And then besides this, we have the plasmid DNA ribosomes. Yes, we have it, which is the site of protein synthesis. Then there is the cell wall and then there is a cell membrane and the cytoplasm. Some bacteria might have flagellum, some might not have any flagellum. Now going through the functions of each cell wall, I've given you a little more detail than was needed for this uh, chapter. Plants are made up of cellulose and fungus, it is made up of chitin. In bacteria, it is made up of peptidoglycan. It's not present in animal cells. It's the outer boundary, it maintains the shape, it prevents from bursting in plant cells, and of course the cell wall is fully permeable. Cell membrane. Now, cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. We'll talk about this later in the next chapter. Prevents ions and polar molecules to pass through. You can say ions, polar molecules, water-soluble molecules, they pass through. So it doesn't allow that. If it has to enter, then it will be through a channel protein. And that is why we say it is partially permeable. Please do not use the word semi-permeable. It's a reject in the mark schemes. And it's an outermost boundary in animal cells, but it is present in all. It's present in plant cells, animal cells, bacteria, fungus, protozoa, and yeast cell. Yeast is also a fungus. The only thing it is not present is it is not present in a virus. So everybody please remember that cell membranes are not present in a virus and they are present in nearly they are present in all living organisms. But we do study viruses in biology. But that's for another reason why we study viruses, but they are no cell. They're in fact not living even. Viruses are not living. Now coming to the next organelle, mitochondria. Now mitochondria is also called the powerhouse of the cell. Now, I don't like using this word because it doesn't make any sense to a student who is not very, uh, who doesn't understand. So basically what does it do? They release energy. Now, release energy. Please remember you don't use the word 
produce energy because energy cannot be created or destroyed that's the third law of, uh, that's the law of thermodynamics i don't know if it's the third or the first law and what does it do it produces atp what is atp atp is the energy currency adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency just like if you go into dubai where well, you'll take dirhams if you go into uk you'll take pounds so the energy currency in all living organism whether it's a plant or an animal or a fungus or a bacteria it requires a molecule of atp so that is why we can say produces atp like for instance you go to dubai so you're going to take your pakistani rupees and going to go to the money changer and convert it into dirhams so that is the currency in dubai now similarly the energy currency and that is why this is called the universal energy currency why because it is in every living organism in every living it's not it's not in anything else but it's only in living organisms like animals and plants and bacteria and you can see here this atp synthase particle plus it's also has its own dna and because it had its own dna it has ribosomes as well so if it's dna then ribosome that means it can make its own proteins because protein synthesis takes place in the presence of dna which has the recipe to make the protein and the ribosome is where the protein is going to be made just like you have a recipe to make a brownie but then you need a kitchen to make the brownie so where you going to bake it so dna and ribosomes go together hand in hand if you need to make proteins now you can see what is here i've shown you a micrograph of a mitochondria and a diagrammatic view of a mitochondria and of course it looks like a spaceship but actually here is where the process of aerobic respiration is going to take place and the release of energy is going to be and here is where atp the molecule which is the universal energy currency is going to be made adenosine triphosphate now an artist view of a chloroplast and of course as you can see here again we have dna and ribosomes in a chloroplast and inside the chloroplast is a pigment which is called chlorophyll and that can convert light energy into chemical energy and here the process of photosynthesis takes place which needs a lot of enzymes so that's why we need the ribosomes and the dna to make its own enzymes so a micrograph this is the micrograph and this is the an artist view of it and you can see this is a tm tm is a transmission electron micrograph uh, micrograph of a chloroplast now coming to the sap vacuole or the central vacuole structure only one central vacuole takes up a large amount of space formed by the fusion of many membrane vesicles called the tonoplast then the function they mainly it's storage uh, the fluid inside the central vacuole called the cell sap store organic compounds such as proteins enzymes inorganic ions potassium chloride used as a disposal site for byproducts that could damage the cell and contains pigments that color the cell just like you can see beetroot then aids in plant growth by absorbing water and supports the structure of leaves and flowers and is only found in plant cells so central vacuole which contains the cell sap that is another thing in the syllabus which you must know about uh, the remaining part of this chapter uh, will continue the remaining part of the chapter will continue in the second video which is the which is the function of the ribosomes and nucleus which was part of 1.1 and 1.2 of chapter 1 will also continue in the second video thank you very much for watching and thank you for subscribing and please do leave your comments for any suggestions which you might have in this new series of videos which i'm making for the 2023 syllabus of the o level biology thank you once again